Ecclesia Word Ministries International proudly presents a ministry of Dream Life Church International. Welcome to the Reformer's Life broadcast, where Dr. John A. Tishola is the senior minister. Today you're going to be tremendously blessed and imparted by the Word of the Lord, and the Spirit of God is going to expose you to higher levels of living, and your life will never be the same again. Dr. John is also the author of over 100 best-selling books globally. Founder of Reformers Bible Training Institute since 1998. Dream Life Church International. Changing and touching lives. Restoring hope and faith to the broken. Reaching people with the gospel. Displaying the love of Jesus. It is our prayer and desire that through this message, you will be imparted, changed, and encouraged to pursue the Lord. So prepare your heart now and expect from the Lord as we go into the message already in progress. How we talked about on last week was the power of creativity. And we said creativity is a byproduct of diligence. And without creativity, our lives can be boring, predictable, stagnated, just in a routine. And we all tend to know someone who fits that description, where they sit in the same place all the time. Even at work, you know, they sit in the same place. They might even wear the same outfit. But it's something about um, creativity that they haven't tapped into yet. But there is creativity that lies in each and every one of us. There's creativity in the arts, you know, when you, those who sing, those who dance. Um, even in school, I don't know if they still have it, but they used to have what's called creative writing, you know, where you could just begin to write. It's like free flow. You just write whatever, you, whatever comes to your mind, and they call it creative writing. With teachers, I find if you're a teacher, you have to be creative when you're working with children because their attention span is short and they get bored very easy. Whether it's in children's church or in the secular world, you have to be creative when you're working with children. We said Creativity is witty inventions, and it's the richness of ideas and originality of thinking. Creativity goes beyond the realm of common sense. Someone sent me a, a text the other day, and they said, creativity is intelligence having fun. <laughs> Webster Dictionary defines creativity as the ability to make new things or think of new ideas. It's a response to solving a problem. And then we spoke about, uh, we read Mark 2, uh, verse 1 through 5. We spoke about the, the four men who were carrying the paralyzed man and how it was so crowded at the door and he couldn't get through. And they said, hmm, OK, I have an idea. And they said, by faith, we're going to get him in there. And they cut a hole through the roof. And they brought him down through the roof. That was creativity. He went in through an unconventional way. We all walked through doors, but they said, you know what? There's something that we need there. He needs to be healed. So we are going in. We're going to get in by whatever means necessary. And that was the roof. It was a response to solving a problem. We said creativity in adults, we talk about children. We said children are just so creative. But in adults, because of the different life experiences that we take on, you know, the things that we go through, the hardships, the trials, the anxieties, the offenses, um, heart and hearts, the doubts, the fears, and even holding on to unforgiveness. The Bible speaks about in Proverbs 4 and 23, it says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it flows the issues of life. And when you have all these things inside your heart, the envy and, and, and the doubt and the fears, it's like a struggle for the cre creativity to come out. There's a fight for it to come out because we've harbored all these things inside of our heart down through the years. That's why we're adults and we pick up things as time goes by and if we're not quick to cast them down, they begin to sit there and they linger and it's a struggle for the creativity that's in us to come out. Creativity is an unconventional way of doing things. Creativity can come forth in the form of wisdom. You know, a lot of times when we share our testimonies and we share our, our creative thoughts, as it's passed along to someone else, it takes on this form of wisdom and it's shared with someone else and then someone else and then someone else. And it begins to be called wisdom. 
everyday activities will require creativity when you want to please God. Whether it's in work, whether it's at school, in the home, if you are a mom, if, if, if you are a wife, even in cooking meals, you have to be creative. You know, there was a time when Pastor came and he was working, I would make dinner and then he would always take the leftovers to work. And then when he would come in, he would say, what's for dinner? And it was leftovers from the leftovers. <laughs> and he would say, oh no, he said, I don't want to eat that again. So I had to learn to be creative with the leftover leftovers. <laughs> Saving money, you have to be creative. When you want to buy a home and you want to buy a car or large ticket items, you have to learn to be creative. We spoke about another power of the spirit of, um, spirit of, spirit of, spirit of diligence releases, and that was the power and the influence even to manage time. You know, we spoke about, you know, time is so important. And it doesn't stand still, it keeps moving. No matter what we do, where we go, it's going to keep moving. And we said time is the most precious gift, the most valuable asset that we will ever have while we're here on this earth. We said you can't buy it, you can't sell it, you can't renew it, you can't save it. When it's gone, it's gone. And there are many times as we, we, we go to sleep, and if we oversleep, we've lost some time. We lost some time, time that we can't get back. Sometimes we miss the bus, we miss the train. We miss certain things because we oversleep and because we lost that particular time. We said there's 24 hours in a day for everyone, for the rich, for the poor, no matter where you are and who you are, there's 24 hours in a day and there's 168 hours in a week. And it's constant, it doesn't change. But the question is, what do we do with our time? And a lot of times we don't take notice of our time, you know, until we're late, until the day is over, and we begin to ask ourselves, what did we do today? And sometimes we don't have much of a list because half of the things that we, we planned on doing weren't carried out. We have to learn to value time. We said time management is the ability to use one's time effectively. One who can manage time wisely is one who values time. You know, and I gave the testimony about uh, I, when I lived in Parchester and I used to look and I could see someone coming by a certain time because that was the time that we had to put my daughter on the bus, and it was a school bus. And I could almost tell time by this particular person. Because when a person is punctual and they value time, you can tell time by them. And if they're not there by a certain time, you say, uh-oh, you know, something might be wrong. One who is conscious of time. You know, from a child's perspective, we say children say they have all the time in the world. They have no concerns about being late, they have no concerns about oversleeping. They have no concerns about getting anything done in a timely manner unless we kind of push them ahead to get them to do it. But as we get older in life, we tend to value time, and we value time more. Every day as we get older, time has gone by. But the question we always tend to ask is, or we say, I need more time. You say, I don't have enough time. If I only had more time. And where did the time go? The time didn't go anywhere. You have the same time today as you had yesterday. The same time you're going to have tomorrow. The same time you're going to have next week. It didn't go anywhere. God has a right to be concerned about time. Why? Because it's his time. And he's concerned about how we spend his time. Do we spend his time foolishly? Do we spend his time wisely? In Apostle Paul's letter to the Ephesians, he cautions the saints to be careful how we live and to make the most opportunity out of everything that we do. And last week we spoke about opportunity. And we said opportunity is a form of time. We said it's a chance. We said it's a sudden period of time. It's a chance. It's a break. It's something that only comes by that one time. Yes, we will have many opportunities in life, but will they be the same? No, they won't be the same. And sometimes we miss 
opportunity. You know, when you're buying a home, it has something called, I think it's a short sale, where when someone uh, can't pay their mortgage and they don't want to face foreclosure, that someone can come in and they can buy the house at a certain price that's lower than normal. And at, during that time, it's an opportunity. But you have to have the money in order to seize the opportunity. You know, opportunity is a window of time. We spoke about that window of time. It comes to everyone, but we have to be positioned to be ready to receive and move upon that opportunity. Opportunity even for witnessing to others. There's an opportunity. There are many times someone might be on our heart to minister to, but God says this is not the right time. And then at a particular time, he says, okay, today is the day. Today is the hour. I need you to speak to that person. Why? Because this is the day that person's heart is open. It's ready to receive. They're going through a lot at the job. They're frustrated, and they've tried everything. And God said, this is the time for you to make your move. This is the time when you can speak to them. Well, I spoke to them before, but he says, yes, but this is the time that they're ready to speak to you, to answer. They're ready to surrender. They're ready to give in. This is the time. That's an opportunity. Sharing your story at the right time is an opportunity. You know, we have testimony. Everybody has a testimony. Some we don't like to share, but... The Bible says we're overcome by our testimonies. And it's that time that we share our testimony to others about where we came from and being transparent. It's those testimonies that change people's lives. Testimonies cause people to come to Christ by hearing your testimony. But it's a time and a place for you to tell your testimony. If you were a thief and you were a pickpocket in your former life, you don't want to share your story with the person sitting next to you tonight. <laughs> but your testimony is important to be shared, but it's an opportunity and a time for you to share that testimony. You can tell time by people who know how to manage their time. You know, people who are t punctual on the job, in the ministry, you could almost tell when they're coming through the door, um, they should be here any minute now. So they should be here any minute now because those are people who usually are always on time. Lives can be saved when you are punctual and you're on time. For many people who might live alone, it's your punctuality, even in going to work, that causes someone to notice that you're late today. Let's call and check on them and make sure they're okay. I, was, I told a testimony, or I shared a testimony, I think about maybe a year ago, that someone shared with me about a young lady who worked in the school system and how she would come into work every morning around the same time. And she would leave around the same time. And when she came into a particular morning and she went on to work, there was a big delivery in the schools. And there were these refrigerators, the big upright, those steel refrigerators, the, the walk-in refrigerators where you have when you like commercial when you're working in a school or a large building. And she, um, a big delivery came, and all the co-workers had left. She said, "Don't worry, I'll handle. I'll take care of everything." So she went inside and she began to unpack the different meats or the vegetables, the produce. And as she went in, the door closed behind her. And when the door closed, it locked, and she couldn't get out but she was a believer, and she began to call upon the name of Jesus. And the security guard that was on duty, he would have normally have left, but he came downstairs, and he just tended to knock on the door, and he heard her hitting against the door, and he opened the door. And she said to him, she said, what made you come down here? He said, you always come in around the same time and you leave around the same time, and you always greet me. He said, so I came to look for you. He said, I came to look for you. And that's because of her punctuality and her mannerism, the same time. And he took note of the fact that it was late, and he did not see her leave the building. And because of him, her life was saved. Punctuality is important. It's like clockwork. Distractions can cause us to mismanage our time. Sometimes we get busy. We get busy uh, uh, doing things. We get busy here and there, and we don't accomplish what we're supposed to accomplish due to the busyness and being distracted. 
We spoke about delegation. When you delegate an assignment to someone else, and we used the, the story of, of Moses and how Jethro counseled Moses regarding spending time wisely, where uh, Moses was trying to um, take care of everything that was going on, be the judge over all the disputes. And his father Jethro had to say to him, he said, listen, he said, have them bring every major dispute to you, but let them judge every minor dispute themselves. So it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burdens with you. Because sometimes if you're in a supervisory position or if you're in authority somewhere, even in your home, you have to take the time to delegate responsibility to someone else so you can spend the time that the Lord gave you wisely. If you're trying to do your job and everyone else's job, you can't accomplish the assignment that God has given you to accomplish. So delegating authority is a form of time. And not to unload all of your work and all of your responsibilities on someone else. There was a sign outside, I said it before, it said, divide the task and double your success. You know, prioritize. This will allow time to be spent in major areas. We spoke about Acts 6 and 2, about those who were teaching and, and trying to wait on tables at the same, certain, same time. We have to be discerning. You know, where should I be right now? You know, what should I be doing right now? The right time being allocated to the right activities. You know, if we're in church, we're in church. When we leave, what do I do when I get home? You know, when we're in the church, church is one of the busiest places. We come in on Sunday morning, and we have plans to see different people, and we have plans to meet with different people. And before we know it, we're home that night. We say, oh, no, I forgot to meet with this person. You know, we have to try to uh, uh, not be easily distracted and gather our thoughts so we can stay in the framework of time. We have to remain focused. Distraction can cause us to, to be out of place sometimes. You know, when we go out to the store, we go to the supermarket, a lot of times we make a list, you know, and sometimes we come back without what we went for. And guess what? We have to go back again. You know why? Because what we went for was very essential. I won't say what it is, but it's very essential. <laughs> So sometimes you have to go back to the supermarket, and this is like double work. You can wear yourself out. You can tire yourself out by doing double work, you know, because you didn't plan properly, you didn't manage your time. You know, focus and not being distracted is very, very important. Sunday mornings is one of the busiest mornings in the week outside of going to work. Especially when you have a family and you're trying to get through the door and everybody has to have what they need to get there and you have a meeting or you have a responsibility. Sunday mornings can be busy. When what you plan on wearing, wearing the night before is not working this morning, you have to begin to plan your time wisely. It could be a communion Sunday. Oh, I need my collar. It's about managing our time. And sometimes when we, we, we get where we're going, we're so angry and we're so frustrated. We're angry with people who don't have anything to do with what happened to us at home. You know, we're upset with people who are not. It's displaced anger. You know, we have an attitude, but it's our fault. We did it, you know. We didn't iron last night. We didn't wash during the week or on Saturday. But at the same time, we come through the door like a hurricane, and we upset with someone who doesn't even live in our house. You know, the wife wants to blame the husband. The husband wants to blame the children, you know. But it's about managing time. And I must say, I stand, I, I'm first in that category. But God, how many know God is working on all of us regarding how we manage his time? Relationships require time. In a marriage, time is required. Husbands need time. Wives need time. The children need time. And yeah, look, the Lord is aware of that. You know, when we're journeying with friends, and we're journeying with, with uh, members in the ministry, those who are potential members, it requires time, time to sit with them, to talk with them. You know, time spent can show just how much you care about a person, even your spouse. You know, when you don't have time, people know when you don't have time for them. They know when you're brushing them off. You know, they know when you say, okay, I'll get right back to you, and you forget to come back. They know time. It's important in relationships. Friendships are important. Part of uh, uh, friendships is cultivating friendship. How do we cultivate friendship? Through spending time with people. 
down through the years. We have friends, childhood friends. We have uh, high school friends. We have friends from jobs previously. Why have we remained friends? Because we have taken the time to cultivate a relationship with them. We've taken the time to meet them, you know, uh, on certain days where we know we have other things to do, but we said, this friendship is important to me, you know? So I'm going to work this into my schedule, time. And then we ended last week, when we talked about Genesis, we just went over Genesis 2 and 2, and we said, it read, and by the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested. He ceased on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. You know, he had a lot of work to do in those six days. God kept everything in perspective. He managed his time appropriately within those six days. I think I gave you the testimony of when I, I grew up in a home where we couldn't do laundry on Sundays. We couldn't wash on Sundays. If you didn't get it done on Saturday, it was just do not done. You know, because Sunday was a day that was a Sabbath day, and my mother just believed in keeping it holy. You know, so if you didn't get it right on that Saturday or that Friday, and we didn't have a washing machine and a dryer in our home, so we had to go to the laundry. But those are the things that caused us to manage our time. We didn't see them as being important then, you know, but they were things that helped us. You know, and if we just kept them, even in emptying your garbage, not leaving dishes in the sink. Those are things that save us time by having to do them quickly in the morning and running out the door and trying to do them quick. Managing our time is very important. Well, tonight we're going to move on, and we're going to move on with another power or influence that the spirit of diligence releases in us, and that's the uh, power of success. The power of success. And I know we asked the question, we said, how many people want to be successful? We all want to be, who doesn't want to be successful? Everybody wants to be successful. But we know in being successful, it's going to be hard work. It's going to be hard work. So the, the, one of the definitions of successful is, success is the result of achieving a milestone based on a desired goal, something we want to achieve. And the Webster's define it as success is measured by standards set by a person or a group. And in some of our homes, you know, our families have set standards where everybody in this house gets a high school diploma or a GED. Everybody in this home, you know, will be a college grad. Those are standards. And then the world sets standards for us also. It says we can't do certain things if we don't do this. But that's, that's the world. You know, success to one person is not necessarily success to another. You know, you might be one that had just gotten your, your high school diploma, and one might not look at it as being successful. But let me tell you something. If you're the first person in your home or you're to, to acquire a high school diploma, it's a big deal, and it's success. Okay, it's success in everything that we achieve in life. Every milestone, every turning point, it's, it's called success. And it's hard. If I can... More. It's a promotion if I decide to go back to school. Nothing in this life is ever complete until nothing more can be done. Mm. That's good. Until nothing more can be done. We should always be looking to exhaust the opportunities and the time we have here on this earth. A successful life is where every opportunity has been exhausted where you have seized every opportunity there is. And opportunities that come around every day, we're always presented with an opportunity. Yeah. You know, many people, you want, we want a car, which is an opportunity for somebody who comes to say, this is a car, but do we have a driver's license? It's important, you have to have a driver's license in order to drive a car. So it's a blessing if you have the license but if not, you miss that opportunity. And the next time, you might have to purchase your car. A successful life, success is never attained by the path of greater resistance. It is attained because you have to struggle. It is attained by the path because you have to struggle. Sometimes there's obstacles when you're going to school and you're, school is not easy. And everybody who knows who they finished school, it's not easy. Your job might not be easy right now. And there are setbacks, and there are delays, and there are struggles that we go through in trying to get to that period of success. 
It takes hard work and it takes sacrifice. It takes a perseverance to not give up. Because there are many times when you're, when you're trying to achieve success, there are many times you want to give up. There are many times you want to throw in the towel. I mean, when I was in nursing school, I wanted to give up. I had a professor. I don't know. She, she just didn't like me. I don't know what it was. And it was rough. And I said, but maybe I'll just disenroll and I'll just come back next semester when she's not there. You know, but I just thank God for the Holy Spirit because I persevered, I persevered, and I made it, <laughs> I made it. The world of society sets standards that can make us appear to be successful when we're really not. You know, buying expensive pocketbooks, you know, driving expensive cars, you know, uh, fame. And we don't have it. We really don't have it. But it's like, what they say, trying to keep up with the Joneses. And everybody knows about the Joneses. It could, your neighbor could be the Joneses. We don't have it. For some reason, we want to appear that we do have this particular thing. But we don't. The Joneses can take you off course. Because your God-given assignment is to go here, but because you are looking at the Jones, what the Joneses have, and trying to keep up with them, you lose your focus and you tend to veer off course. It's hard work when you're trying to keep up with others and you're influenced by other people. You know, when you're trying to compete and you're trying to be like the Joneses and everybody else, it's a lot of work. It's not easy. But when you begin to settle and you begin to do what God has called you to do, and it could almost be the same thing, but there's an ease and there's a grace that comes in. You know, where you're no longer struggling and you're no, it's no longer hard anymore. Where you, you're doing what God has called you to do. But it's the same work, but it's just peace with the work. It's grace with the work. We shouldn't imitate the traditions of the world. And in Romans 12 and 2, you don't have to turn there. But it says, and do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs, but be transformed and progressively change as you mature spiritually by the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes so that you may prove for yourselves what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect in his plan and purpose for you. Being transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know, the more we renew our mind, the more we begin to see our purpose in life, the more we begin to see our assignment. You know, because when you begin to take your mind off of those things, you begin to miss out on what God really has for us. And then we begin to waste time. True success begins with remaining in right standing with God. You know, when you're walking upright and you're doing what the Lord requires us to do and we're living right, there's no option. Success is ours. Success in this world without Christ is not good. It won't last. I don't care how many cars you have, how much money you have, how much notoriety, how much fame, how much prestige. It will not last if you don't know who our God is. In Matthew 16 and 26, it reads, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world, the glamour, the fame, the money, everything, the wealth, the success, the fame, but forfeits his soul? Oh, what a man give, what a man will give to, for exchange for his soul. You know, money, fame, fortune, it's not what you have, but it's who you know. It's who you know, the one true and living God. Success without Christ can't be maintained. You know, we have the gospel singers, and we have actors, and we have different celebrities you know, who at some point in time, they were doing well. They were running well. They were on course. They grew up in church. Their parents were pastors, and they were leaders. And somewhere along the line, they compromised, and they began to veer off. And there are many of them. Well, they, they know the Lord, and they're not even here anymore, but they knew the Lord. They knew what was right. They knew God, you know, but at the same time, they, tend, they went the other way. You know, there was a well-known pop star 
uh, uh, R&B uh, dancer years ago, not too many years ago, you know, he achieved a certain amount of success and he pretty much had, you know, everything in the natural, but he didn't really have any peace. He didn't have any peace and, and he couldn't sleep. So what had to happen, he had to actually get someone to pay him, pay for him to sleep at night, to put him to sleep at night because he had no peace. He had no peace. Can you imagine paying someone thousands of dollars just for peace because you can't sleep at night? You know, sleep is free, you know? Especially when you love the Lord, my beloved, I give you a sweet and a sound sleep. But this gentleman had to pay someone because there was no contentment, there was no peace. He couldn't sleep, so he was paying somebody thousands and millions of dollars to put him to sleep at night. I remember going to the dentist and, and I, had, I had that wisdom tooth extracted and I said to the rest of them, does my, my, my insurance cover any type of sedation? And he said, no, it only covers you going to sleep. Anything else you have to pay for? I said, well, I'll just pay because I did not want to go to sleep. I want to go to sleep on my own. I do not want anyone to put me to sleep. But those who like to go to sleep is fine. But I like to go to sleep on my own. So 1 Timothy 6 and 6, turn it with me if you will. It's talking about, you know, the, the fame and the fortune of people who, you know, think they have it made and they don't know Christ. They think they have, you know, everything. When you don't have Christ, you really don't have much of nothing. So 1 Timothy 6, chapter 6 to the 11th verse. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people are eager for money. They have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. And those are those superstars, and those are the pop artists who knew the Lord, but because they, they wandered, they wandered away from the faith. And now they're not, they have all this grief. The Bible says the blessings of the Lord, they're made rich. Yeah. You know, but when we lose sight of who God is, that's when sorrow begins to be added to it. That's when sorrow comes. And the final charge to Timothy was, but you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. That's what success is. Success is the pursuit of righteousness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Success is not for us alone. You know, when we acquire these degrees and we acquire promotions on the job and we decide, uh, acquire these positions in life that make us, um, you know, that advance us in life, it's not just for us. Right. It's not just for us. We strive for, for, for success so that the Lord can be glorified. Yes, right. So he can be glorified. So that we can make a difference in the world. Where we work and what we do in our communities. You know, with our neighbors. You know, we are chosen to make a difference yes. in our communities. Where we live. You know, what we do, how we speak to people. They are watching. Good morning. How are you? It's to make a difference in the world. I love praying for children because with children, you have a chance to be able to mold. The Bible says, say it and it shall be. You can mold them with your words. You can mold them with your, with your thoughts. You know, children, God says, I call them while they're young. I call them while so they can make a difference in the world. We complain about the president and the White House and the political system, but we have the opportunity to pour into these children through prayer. And the Bible says, I call them while they're young so I can place them in the White House, so I can place them in media, so I can place them in a political position I call them while they're young and we have the opportunity to speak life into these children to speak where we want them to go the Bible says train them up in the way they should go because when they're old they won't depart we have the opportunity to speak to them to say they will not depart from the Word of God they will not depart from truth it is our I believe it's our obligation to pray and to pour into the young because those are the ones that really are going to further affect the world for Christ those are the ones we need to see more uh, Christians in these arenas. 
and they start with our children. The Bible says that the one generation passes away. He said another one comes, and it comes, and it comes. But his word still abides in the earth. In your workplace, he called us to make a difference. No matter what you're doing, what's your position, to make a difference in the workplace and speaking to those who you work with. In whatever capacity you're in, it should not be named that we're not, we're not speaking to someone because we are the believer. We are supposed to be the bigger person. You know, the Bible says, let your light shine so that men can see your good works. It's not always in what we do, but how we carry ourselves. You know, how do you carry yourself? You know, are you caught in the midst of confusion? Are you caught in the midst of things that have nothing to do with you? But how we present ourselves is very important in our families. You know, when we go and we have family gatherings and family communions, we don't want to be the one that everybody's running from. You know, the one when you sit there, everybody gets up, they have to all go to the bathroom at the same time? No. No, we want to be the one that when, we, when they cuss, oh, come, come, come. You know, I want to talk to you. We were just talking about you. It's something I want to ask you. You know, you want to be the one that can say, okay, I'm coming, and someone is waiting to see you. Someone yeah. wants some information. They want some advice. They're ready to become born again. You know, but it's about making a difference. And I believe God calls us to be successful so we can make that difference in the world. John 17 and 4. You can turn there. He said, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Success is glorifying God by completing our assignments. We all have an assignment. And to some of us, we have more than one assignment. But the question is, am I carrying out my assignment now? You know, God is looking for us to make sure that we're in the right place at the right time. I think Pastor Vicki says it all the time in her benediction, right place, right time, doing the right thing. Because when you are, you can't miss opportunity. Because that's what opportunity is. You know, God is looking at us to be the forerunners. He's looking at us to be the ones that, as we are carrying out our assignment, it's not just about us, it's about other people. It's our assignment is bigger than us. Yeah, our assignment is bigger than you, and it's bigger than me. But it's about carrying it out on a daily basis. You don't do it one time, and you don't do it anymore, but every day. And guess what? When that assignment is over, there's another assignment. Remember, we keep on until there's nothing else to do. So after you complete one assignment, you say, oh, I'm finished now. Nope, you're not. Next, there's another assignment coming your way. Let's look at some ways that the scripture says how to be successful. How to be successful. You know, and coming up as, as children, if you were born into the house, or even if you weren't, of parents who were always giving you advice, a lot of advice was advice for even when they're not here anymore. It was advice that was given to us that we, that we, we still remember now, you know, in growing up. Advice that we share with our children. You know, we share with our nieces and our nephews, you know, as a journey through life. And it talked about, <clears throat> sorry here. I saw, I mean, David, when David was talking to Solomon, and David was saying to Solomon, he said, you know, I'm leaving here. And he said, you know, in one verse, says, I go the way of the earth. You know, he said, I go the way of the earth. He said, but if you do these things, and you do what I'm telling you to do, he said, everything will go well for you. But if you don't, and you compromise, it won't be good. So David was coming to the end, and he was giving him instructions on how to be and how to remain successful in life. So in 1 Kings 2 and 3, you can turn there. This is, this, is, this is the end of his time. He had, David had accomplished everything that the Lord had given him to accomplish. He said, I have done my work, you know, I, I finished my course. So now before I leave here, I want to impart. I want to impart something to my son Solomon so he can maintain a successful life. In 1 
Kings 2 and 3, this is what uh, David was saying to Solomon. He said, keep the charge of the Lord your God. That is, fulfill your obligation to walk in his ways. Keep his statutes, his commandments, his precepts, his testimonies, and his ad as it is written in the law of Moses, so that you may succeed in everything that you do and wherever you turn. These were the words that David gave to Solomon when he was, before he passed away. He said, live according to the word of God. Whatever you do, live according to truth. You cannot fail. We were in leadership the other night, and Apostle was stressing, truth, it never changes. Truth will always be truth. He said, live according to the word of God. And he said, be obedient to the assignment that the Lord gives you. Be obedient. A lot of times, we, our assignments are given to us. We know by God, but sometimes a person in authority gives us an assignment. That's part of the assignment the Lord has for us. You know, be obedient to that assignment. And then in another scripture, in Joshua 1 and 7, this is where the Lord was commanding Joshua. It was a command to Joshua. It was a command because Moses had passed on and Joshua was taking the reign. And he said, let me talk to you, Joshua. This is, this is a commandment in Joshua 1 and 7. And he said, you know, I know that this is new for you, <laughs> but he said, only be strong and very courageous. He said, be careful to do everything in accordance with the entire law which Moses, my servant, commanded you to do. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left so that you may prosper and be successful wherever you go. So he said to him, he said, don't compromise, even through challenging situations. And that's for all of us, including myself. Don't compromise. There's so many uh, uh, ways for us to, com so many opportunities for us to compromise. You know, to take shortcuts and to half do things and to not finish our course well. Because nobody compromises when times are good. You know, we compromise when times are bad. We want to compromise. But he said, no, don't compromise. So tonight we talked about many things. You know, we talked about the success and how to maintain success in this life and how it's so important that as we walk with God and we remain in right standing, that we will be successful. But it's when we deviate and we come out of the will of the Father that we tend to forfeit those things. We talked about success and how it's a milestone and it's a turning point in our life. It's a place that we get to, a place where we've never been before. You know, milestones are places where we've never been before, but it's an achievement of a goal. It's something that we put our eyes on and we said we want to be able to move ahead. We want to seize that. We want to achieve that. It's a goal. We said successful people always please God. You know, and it glorifies God. It glorifies God when we give an opportunity to make a difference in the world. As we live according to God's word and we don't compromise, we will always remain successful no matter what we are doing. You may stand on your feet tonight. Father, I just thank you tonight, Lord. Father, I thank you for your word. And Father, I thank you for your concern about your people tonight. Father, I thank you that, Lord, you're always concerned about us. You're concerned about how we live and you're concerned about what we do and how we spend time. Father, I just thank you tonight for always giving us everything that we need. Father, even as the songwriter said, everything we ever wanted, we can always find in you. You always give us what we need to progress. You give us what we need to be successful. You give us everything we need to succeed in this life and on this earth. Father, I thank you tonight, Father, for in areas where we might have veered off, in areas where we have not kept your truths, 
in ways that we have not displayed and we have not glorified you. Father, I thank you that you are the God of a second chance. Well, Father, I thank you, the Lord, even in hearing your word and hearing your heart and hearing your teaching as we move into the next days and the next weeks, that, Father, it will be our utmost desire that you be glorified. You said if you would be lifted up, you said I would draw all men unto you. Father, I thank you right now, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that because of you, Lord, we see things in a different way. Father, I thank you that, Lord, we see things as being new and that because we can begin again. Well, Father, I thank you, the Lord, for the charge, even to go into our workplaces and to be in our homes and to make the difference, to make the difference in the earth, to make the difference with our family members, to those who we have not spoken to for months and for weeks, for those who we have casted aside. Father, I thank you that you are the God of a second chance tonight. For those who we have held grudges with and those who we don't speak to and those who we might envy, for whatever reason, you are the the God of a second chance. And Father, we know that it does not please you. So Father, we thank you that Lord for making a way, making a way in the workplace, making a way with our supervisors in areas where we might not have responded well in the workplace, in areas where we might have not responded well with our supervisors, with our co-workers. Father, I pray right now that Lord, you are God of forgiveness. And I take authority even right now, even over those spirits of, of insubordination. I take authority over the spirit of disobedience even right now on your job. Father, I speak to your workplace. I speak to workplace conditions right now. And Father, I say move by your spirit. Father, I pray right now that you say you cause all things to work together for your good. Well, Father, I pray right now that even when we go to work tomorrow, that Father, it will be a different environment. Why? Because we are the light. We are the light of the world. Well, Father, I just thank you tonight, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that we will leave not the sanctuary the same, but, Father, we will leave making a difference with our neighbors, with our friends, with our family. Father, I declare that we will affect the world for Christ, and you will be glorified. You will be glorified. You will be glorified. Yeah in the earth, on our jobs, in our homes. You will be glorified tonight. Father, I just thank you tonight, Lord. I thank you for minds that are made up and minds that are ready to make even personal changes in their own life, in our own lives. Father, I just thank you, Lord. And we honor you, we honor you, we honor you. And we say tonight, be glorified. Amen, amen. Come on, let's just worship. Baruch Publishing proudly presents Dr. John A. Teshola and his new release, Apostolic Lessons for Apostolic Leaders, Volume 1. Advancing the Apostolic Reformation demands that we understand the role of the apostolic anointing and ministry in our contemporary society so that we can effectively engage and empower our regions and nations with the strength of Reformation. In this book, Dr. John Tashola deals with some very key lessons and truths that every apostolic leader and believer must learn and embrace about the lifestyle of the apostle and the apostolic church that is pivotal to advancing the Reformation in his or her region and nation. In this book, you will learn the following. The Ministry of the Apostle in Contemporary Times the different kinds of contemporary apostolic leaders, contrasting kingdom leaders from church leaders, the abuses and blessings of the contemporary apostolic movement, obstacles to building true covenant apostolic network, and much more. Available online at ecclesiaword.org or by calling us at 718-904-8530. Order your copy of Apostolic Lessons for Apostolic Leaders, Volume 1, for the ministry gift of only $15. Today, get this resource that will teach you the proper strategies for advancing the Apostolic Reformation. Baruch Publishing proudly presents Dr. John A. Tishola and his new release, Staying on the Edge of the Spirit. 
Walking with God often demands that we stay consistently on the edge of the Spirit of God. But sometimes we lose our edge in the very things that we were once passionate about and end up becoming stuck in our relationship with the Lord. Losing one's edge is often a gradual process that we don't recognize and pay attention to. But it is at these moments in our walk with the Lord that we must be sensitive and discerning to recognize the assignments of the enemy against us and press in, which enables us to regain our edge in the things of God to avoid spiritual disaster. In this book, Dr. John Tashola deals with some very key strategies and ways to stay sharpened in the spirit in order to always accomplish God's purpose for your life. This book will teach you the following, the importance of staying on the edge, how believers lose their edge in the spirit, how to have a fresh encounter with the Lord, how to be revived again to a spiritual edge, and much more. Available online at ecclesiaword.org or by calling us at 718-904-8530. Order your copy of Staying on the Edge of the Spirit for the ministry gift of only $11. Get the book that will keep you sharp in the spirit today. If you have been blessed, changed, and imparted by today's message, we would like to extend an opportunity for you to partner with us to impact the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Dear friends, join with us and together we can change the world. Partner with us and share in what God is doing through Reformers Life Broadcast. Call us at 718-904-8530 or visit us at www.ecclesiaword.org today. Thank you for joining Reformers Life Broadcast. We hope you have been blessed and imparted by this teaching, and we look forward to being with you again. To request this teaching in its entirety and for a complete catalog of all of our books, CDs, and DVDs, please visit us at ecclesiaword.org. Remember that you are a reformer, and you walk in the anointing of reformation, and your faith in God is changing your circumstances.